Hey, it's Josh with Cultural Catholic coming at you with another Monday video. Sorry, things got a little crazy yesterday. Um, anyways, so uh, today's video is on Confucianism, and I thought uh, after Taoism, atheism would be the shortest video. I am wrong. I am very much so wrong. Um, Confucianism will probably end up being the second shortest video after Taoism. So... Confucianism was started around the same time uh, during the Zhou dynasty in the state of Lu uh, by a man named Confucius. Uh, uh, so little explanation. Uh, the state is so like last time the way that China that uh, for a long time China's uh, ruling class set things up was a very feudal like European feudal style where um, the emperor and his family would be set up in one particular city, uh, usually named after them. And then all of the other, uh, cities would usually have like a duke. And f sometimes these dukes would get to the point where they were basically their own independent kingdoms. Uh, and... Confucius lived during this this time, uh, and this was like during the uh, the autumn period, which would later learn, turn into the Warring States period. Um, so things were not uh, were, were fairly chaotic, uh, and uh, Confucius wanted to recreate kind of like this orderly uh, orderly society. However, during his lifetime, his teachings were not taken up. Um, so for a long time, he traveled around from state to state trying to get uh, a, a duke or king, basically at this point in time, in a various kingdom, province, to try to uh, follow his teachings to kind of recreate some sort of order out of the chaos. Um, so that's kind of the origins of Confucianism. Uh, important... Uh, doctrine. Now, much like Taoism, there doesn't, there isn't really a doctrine per se uh, in a religious sense. Um, what Confucius was really uh, concerned about was ethics, how to uh, set up a proper society that was well ordered so as to create as much uh, prosperity and propriety as possible so that people could flourish in this lifetime because Confucianism is very much concerned with the here and now, as opposed to um, an afterlife. Um, uh, so uh, there are uh, uh, five relationships uh, that uh, the, that the um, there are several, several relationships that Confucianism holds is very important. It is ruler subject, Father, son, uh, and wife, husband. Um, so basically, the uh, the uh, uh, there was a, the idea is that both in both groups within each relationship had to um, show some sort of propriety to each other. The ruler or the, and the father were supposed to look after and protect the the subject of, or the uh, uh, son and teach them and the son and subject were supposed to uh, obey and follow the under the the uh, the and uh, uh, be respectful of the the father or the emperor uh, and slightly different relationship between husband and wife as one could imagine and a way to and this was all in the effort to become Junzi or uh, a, a respectable honorable person uh, and uh, to fulfill these roles and to become Junzi you needed to uh, cultivate cultivate Ren which is uh, in is which is like uh, uh, self-improvement uh, or uh, things of that nature and uh, Use that Ren in Li or right practice. Um, so hypothetically, 
the uh, the the lee of a father is to teach the son, and the lee of the son is to respect the father. Um, there are several uh, important documents within Confucianism. There are the five classics and the four uh, teachings, if I remember correctly. Uh, and the most important of all nine of these books is the Analects, which is, which basically are like the Hadiths of Confucian, Confucius. These are important sayings and actions that Confucius himself uh, said and wrote down. Um, and uh, that is basically how uh, Confucianism today has been passed down from generation to generation. Um, now, normally at this next point, I would talk about the various like splits in doctrine that we now see today. However, Confucianism doesn't really follow this pattern, um, and we'll probably see this next week with Yoruba religion and a little bit with atheism. Uh, so Confucianism for a long time was basically just the original teachings of Confucius. It was uh, a means to live ethically, uh, to try to create a ideal society. Then the Qin Dynasty comes along and decides to burn Confucian books. That goes on for a little bit because the Qin Dynasty is one of the shortest dynasties, if not the shortest dynasty in Chinese history. Then after a while, Confucianism is kind of like the by the wayside, but then eventually under the Song Dynasty, if I remember correctly, it becomes kind of like the official state ideology or orthodoxy. And it's how uh, individuals become uh, uh, bureaucrats within uh, the Chinese government. And then a little bit after the Song Dynasty, this thing called Neo-Confucianism starts up. And Neo-Confucianism takes Confucian ideas and then mixes them with religious practices like Taoist and Buddhist uh, meditation and prayer and sacrifice. Um, and Confucianism kind of gains the trappings of religion uh, minus uh, clergy. It has temples nowadays, and sacrifices are uh, done at these temples. Uh, Taoists view Confucius as kind of like a god, whereas Confucians just view Confucius as a man. Um, there's also uh, a thing called New Confucianism, which basically is trying to uh, place Confucianism in the modern world to kind of uh, uh, show that Confucianism is ju is just like any other ideology, and it can't and it uh, uh, and, and of course to modernize it for the world to kind of include things like feminist Confucianism and things of that nature. Um, so yeah, that's kind of those parts of Confucianism. Uh, uh, Confucianism today, uh, it's very very hard to pin down numbers. While Confucianism is not one of the five recognized religions, which, as we said last week, were Taoism, Buddhism, Catholicism, Protestantism, and Islam, um, the saying goes that a, that a Chinese individual uh, is uh, wearing a Confucian cap, Taoist robes, and Buddhist sandals, meaning that... Uh, uh, all sort every Chinese person has some like practices and follows some Confucian thought, and this is actually kind of true in a lot of East and Southeast Asia. Um, obviously, where uh, in uh, Taiwan, China, Hong Kong, Macau, and Singapore, which has a high proportion of Chinese and uh, people of Chinese descent, Confucianism is uh, very powerful, as is in Korea, the Koreas, uh, Japan, and Vietnam. Uh, and basically anywhere where there's a heavy Chinese influence, Confucianism has found its way into the culture and society. Um, for instance, uh, in, in Japan, uh, people are very much, uh, very Confucian in how, uh, if they see a stoplight, even if there aren't any cars going down the street, they stand at the stoplight and just wait, uh, for the stoplight to turn to green. Um, so Confucianism, while it doesn't have uh, a set number of followers or uh, clergy or things of that, that nature, which can very easily define the definite numbers of Confucian practitioners, 
Um, it is very much uh, influential in the cultures that we see in East and Southeast Asia today. Uh, so this is Josh with Cultural Catholic. I will see you tomorrow, because tomorrow's Wednesday, with International Wednesday. See you then.